It was the 12th of June in 1873, and a hot wind from the southwest brought hordes of Rocky Mountain locusts into Minnesota. They ate everything in sight, including blankets frantic farmers used to cover their crops. The following spring, eggs hatched, and the young hoppers were even hungrier and more plentiful. They swarmed into 23 counties. Farmers told of the skies being so full of hoppers it looked like it was snowing in July. This continued for four years. Desperate farmers wrote to Governor Pillsbury for help. Town of Alba, Jackson County, Governor J.S. Pillsbury Esquire. If you got any more relief provisions, I wish you would send me some, as I have none. I want to stay at home and put in some crop and stay and raise something for next February winter. 15, 1877, Governor J.S. Pillsbury. Dear sir, this county, although ravaged by grasshoppers for three years in succession, has refrained from calling for aid, thinking that we could take care of our own poor. But there has just been brought to my notice a case that seems to call for more than ordinary sympathy. The children Mr. Pillsbury, are buried, and have hardly dear sir, I write to you now if you will send me some clothes. I'm in the grasshopper region. Money is so scarce that I cannot get any. I have four brothers besides myself. I have no mother nor father to take care of us. A despairing wife asks mercy for her husband, who justly, but perhaps too severely, has been condemned to 10 months imprisonment in the county jail at St. Cloud. Now I have two children for whom I have nothing to live of because grasshoppers eat everything last year. They have kept from starving by catching a few fish, the children going on the ice barefooted and standing on a little hay while fishing. Calls have been so frequent that our people are nearly taxed to their utmost limit, and I write you. I'll have to leave my place without any crops. I have 50 acres under cultivate. We are eight in the family, and the oldest of the children is only 10 years. Six children Say in all. Word of mercy. Trusting you will help soon. The right of pardoning is the noblest prerogative which your office bestows, and you will not leave it unused in our behalf, for which we will ever pray. And I cannot see them go without clothes. From Moravis Brown, Anything address Hutchinson. Anything you may see fit to send, either money, clothing, or provisions, will be properly distributed and put where it will do the most good. Respect, C.H. Goodsell, Hutchinson. Governor Pillsbury did not want to ruin the moral fiber of the poor with handouts. So, to fight the grasshopper plague, he declared April 26, 1877 as a statewide day of fasting and prayer. Four years after they arrived, the grasshoppers flew out of the state. By the middle of August, Minnesota was free of them, and the farmers harvested the biggest wheat crop the state had ever known. Now, some people insist that it was the governor's day of prayer and fasting that succeeded in banishing the grasshoppers. Some say they just went looking for a new supply of food. 113 prairie schooners passed by the office of the Laverne Herald during five days of last week. St. Paul Daily Globe, May 9, 1876. It was the 1880s and Minnesota was in her boom years. Land was plentiful and immigration was high. The railroads lured people with the riches Minnesota had to offer. Through its valley. For sale. One million five hundred thousand acres. Stop. Timber, Did prairie, you know and meadowland. Minnesota and thousand sale. beautiful farm homes. Minnesota, cure for the panic. Emigrate to the Minnesota. The man of small means can soon reach competency. Climate dry and healthy. It was a mortality show. There is no city in the United States so healthy as St. Paul. We walked through every prominent street and found only one undertaker's shop. And on the door of it was a placard, no admittance except on business. Business was so poor that the owner, no doubt, had too many friends who make his shop a lounging place. He will have to move away or open a lager beer saloon. A home to be proud of. 
peruse the statement of and a successful farmer. during threshing farmer. times, the wages are $2 a day. The immigrants and other working people can hardly get off the train and walk across the street before there is someone after them that wants to hire them. But the advertisements failed to mention Minnesota's tougher side, at least not honestly. The atmosphere in Minnesota in the winter is like a wine, so exhilarating in its effects on the system. The extreme cold does not last but for a few days. January 29, 1882. 18 below zero. Got up late. Began to wear underclothing. LJG, Archer Burton. A new invention has been made by a Swede by name of Pear O. Elliott, 905 Washington Avenue South. It is a simple little apparatus designed to aid in attaching the postage stamp to a letter, thus making it unnecessary to fumble around with big and clumsy fingers in an attempt to affix it. As soon as the inventor receives the patent papers, he will sell his invention, preferably to a Swede. Several prospective buyers have already contacted him. Svenska Amerikanska Posten, May 21st, 1895. Amanda Lee and Andrew Bell met in Sunday school at age eight. That was 1874. During the course of their childhood romance, Andrew placed a ring on Amanda's finger. Soon after that, he left to travel as an attendant for an Englishman. They lost touch. Until seven years later, when a teacher of Amanda's wrote to her. Ripon, Wisconsin, 1881. Miss Lee, you will please excuse me for not asking permission to write to you before committing the act, but often circumstances alters a good many cases. By the merest chance Monday, in taking breakfast at the Grand Pacific Hotel, I came across an old acquaintance of yours who made me promise to write and ask whether you had forgotten a playmate by the name of Andrew Bell. It seems he knew you in Kittysville, Missouri, and is very anxious to renew his old acquaintance with you and your sisters, whose names he seems to be quite familiar with, yours particularly. You were both quite young when he knew you, and he is somewhat afraid you won't remember him, and hopes you will, for he will be so disappointed, and asked me to give you his address, which is to the Grand Pacific Hotel. His name is Andrew Bell. This gentleman is in Chicago, Illinois. I am in Ripon, Wisconsin. Sincerely, your friend, Helen Ralph. Amanda Lee, please write to him. She did, and in 1886, they were married. The first day I came to St. Paul, it was a cold day. The temperature was 40 degrees below zero. It was New Year's Eve, 1886. I rode to the place where I was to be married to Andrew J. Bell on a cable car in which the floor was padded with hay to keep one's feet warm. Nevertheless, my feet were so cold when I arrived at my destination, I could hardly walk. One of the grand things which I feasted my eye upon was the second ice palace. To me, naturally, it was a very exciting event. In Missouri, one doesn't see such events. Never was a city laid out so badly as St. Paul. The plot of the town, with its numerous additions, looks as if some accident had knocked all the streets into pie. Measures should be taken immediately to straighten and reform them as far as practical before it is too late. The Minnesota Democrat Weekly, September 30th, 1851. Logging, mining, and farming were all at high gear. Horace Glenn was 21 years old when he headed north to the lumber camps to make money. 
Smith Camp, March 10th, 1901. My dear parents, today is my 22nd birthday, but I feel like a kid of 10. I've always enjoyed the best of health and spirits, but never, I believe, in such a degree as lately. My supply of animal spirits seems inexhaustible. I can work hard for 12 hours and feel as fresh as a daisy with the morning dew on it. The perfect spring weather is partly responsible for it, I suppose. It is only evenings when I am forced to associate with these beasts they call Swedes that I get depressed. But as soon as I get out in the morning, I forget them, forget that I am lousy, and enjoy myself and nature. I am the first man out in the morning because walking two or three miles behind a group of Swedes is something impossible to a person with a delicate nose. The only smell which I have encountered which approaches it is the odor of a lot of Russians on a railroad hand car when well warmed up. It is an odor which could only come from generations of unwashed ancestors. And no man can hope to acquire it in one lifetime without the aid of heredity. It also reminds me of times when I have been out hunting and have come unexpectedly to the windward of a dead horse. It gives the ravens the same idea, for wherever there is a bunch of Swedes working, there are always buzzards or ravens perched around the trees. My swamping partner is a Norwegian, of a little better grade than the average, and my precepts and practices have worked wonders with him. I prevailed upon him to wash his feet after three months total abstinence from water. He differs from the others in that he is not averse to adopting American customs and learning the language. He has a great respect for me, and he confided to me yesterday that when I first came, he sized me up as a different and superior type from other Americans here. Now he, in the course of time, will probably marry and encourage his children to adopt American ways. And in the course of a few generations, they may hope to eradicate that distasteful foreign odor and become good citizens, and my humble influence will have had some effect. <laughs> I might formulate a proverb out of this that there is more patriotism in teaching a Norwegian to wash his feet than in fighting Philippines, or something like that. But as a rule, precept or example are pearls before swine in these backwoods, and I have not bothered myself in scattering many of them. Besides, I have a few beams to cast out of my own eyes before I bother with my brother's moats. If I had studied zoology more diligently when at school, I could derive considerable satisfaction from the study of human louse this winter, and I would never be at a loss for specimens. I never realized before what a complicated creature he was. In fact, I never made his acquaintance till last fall on the railroad. They are of all shapes and sizes, varied colors. Some can run fast and some can scarcely wiggle, but they all multiply very rapidly and they all bite. Nothing but boiling water will kill them. The most intense cold does not affect them. Some people seem to derive a certain satisfaction from them, which is embraced in a saying very much in vogue here. It is, blessed is the man who has body lice, for he knoweth the benefit of a scratch. I think it deserves to be ranked among the other Beatitudes. I found an entirely new species this morning with no legs on it. Horace Glenn started law school in 1911, and as you can imagine, graduated first in his class. A blood-curdling murder occurred at Wells on Wednesday. Henry Ringer, owner of a meat market, was stabbed to death with a huge butcher knife by a man in his employ named Cor. Briefly told, Ringer, suspecting improper relations between Cor and his wife, came home clandestinely and secreted himself under the bed and was discovered by Cor, who, supposing him to be a burglar, killed him instantly. It is a sad state of affairs in which a wife's infidelity seems to have been the inciting cause. Martin County Sentinel, September 15th. 1893. Immigrants were lured to the Minnesota Iron Range with the promise of prosperous work. 
What they found instead were dangerous working conditions and low pay. The miners formed their first strike in 1907 on the Mesabi Range. Victor Milimaki, newly immigrated from Finland, found himself caught in the middle of it. Everett, Minnesota, August 5, 1907. Dear brother, I just returned from the post office and got your letter. I decided to answer it right away, conveying my heartfelt thanks for it. I have kept in good health, which is what I hope for you there in my homeland. Now I'll describe a bit of what the conditions are like over here. There's a great strike going on. There are many of us out of work. I don't know how long the strike will last. It's only been two and a half weeks since it started, and this isn't a very pleasant time at all. There are 100 stooges with guns paid by the mining companies harassing the workers just like they're some animals. A worker can't peacefully walk down the street anymore. They say this America is the land of the free, but that's a lie. A week ago, Finnish socialists in Michigan had a large summer festival and they used some old flags in the festival procession, just like in the customers in Finland. About 100 of them began to march to the festival site, but the local police and their accomplices met them, took their flags away, beat up 13 marchers, and threw them in jail. You wrote that Gala would like to come here. I'll sure send him a ticket, but not now. I myself might have to leave here if this strike lasts very long. The workers have decided to strike for a year if their demands aren't met. They are asking for $3 a day and an eight-hour day. If we win the strike, I'll send Gale a ticket right away. Greetings to everyone in my homeland. Your brother, Victor Milumeki. The miners didn't get their $3 a day. In 1880, the Census of Minnesota Records lists 69,000 Norwegians, 39,000 Swedes and Finns, 67,000 Germans, 1,500 African Americans, and one Japanese. Joseph Johnson, a 20-year-old black man from Mobile, Alabama, came north looking for opportunities. A friend of mine came to St. Paul and returned to Mobile. He was well-dressed and said he worked in a bank. It was 1888 and I was 20 years old. I came here because I was impressed by what this friend from St. Paul said. He was prosperous and I felt by coming here, I would become prosperous too. When I got here, I looked him up. He worked in a bank all right. He was the washroom attendant and had no influence nor connections and could not help me in any way. I applied for a job as a blacksmith's helper because I had experience at that work, but they didn't hire Negroes. I looked a long time. And then one day I applied to the Pullman Company for a job and was hired. It was June 12, 1889. I was hired as a buffet man to work on trains which ran to Omaha, Nebraska, Chicago, St. Paul, and Maine. I worked with the Pullman Company for eight years and for 43 years with the Great Northern Railroad. I made $25 a month in the early days which was good money. Joseph Johnson helped to organize the railroad union for dining car workers. Six or seven of the sporting citizens of St. Paul started off about eight days since on a hunting and trouting excursion to Rush River. Having only 15 gallons of brandy along with them, they returned on the eighth day, being out of necessaries. The Minnesota Pioneer, January 2nd, 1850. Hey, it's cold out there. 
Stay here and watch the rest of Bring Warm Clothes coming up. Hey, get in here, you guys. Set that down and get on in here. Don't, hey, get, get.